Thank you for having me here today. It's great to be in my hometown of Spokane. Happy Valentine's Day to you all. I know you're all here because you all heart health care reform. <laughs> exactly. So the Affordable Care Act itself is about 300 pages. Today, since then, I have a stack of paper in my office that's about this tall. So I have 15 to 20 minutes to try and distill that stack of paper down. So next slide, please. What I'm going to distill this down to is the employer mandate. That's the big one, what requires us to provide health care reform. So does it apply to you? What's the impact on small businesses? That's what something else a lot of people need to think about. How do you determine what coverage must be offered, and how do you avoid that penalty? We'll talk about some key considerations and requirements for small businesses, and then other obligations for big and small businesses. Next slide. So the basic rule of the employer mandate, we have other people that will talk about the penalty and how you work through that in detail, but the basic rule is that you will be subject to a penalty tax if you fail to offer minimum essential health coverage to all full-time employees and their dependents, you ever offer coverage that's not affordable, or the plan's value uh, they, of the benefits that you provide falls below a certain percentage, and there's about 200 pages of regulations on what that means. <clears throat> Most ma major medical plans will suffice that, but there's online calculators, actu actuarial calculations, and all sorts of things if you care to know about that. Next slide. So first step in determining all this analysis, and I really encourage businesses to start thinking about this now. There are a lot of strategic decisions that have to be made, not just on an HR level, but as, at an executive level, because this is really fundamental to a lot of people's businesses. It's going to change maybe how you operate a lot of things, your payroll systems, your IT departments, your record keeping. So go through this analysis now. You'll be doing yourself a really big favor if you do that. So first of all, step one, am I large? It's really not as simple as you would think. So we'll go through the analysis. Next slide. So are you large? A large employer is someone who, on average, in the prior year, had at least 50 full-time employees, including full-time equivalents. That's where I think it's not as simple as just going, OK, I have 50 full-time employees. First of all, 50, not 40 hours. It's 30 hours uh, per month, of, or 30 hours per week. And now the IRS has new guidance that says, well, not 30 hours per week. We really don't know how to count by week anyways. We're just going to call it 130 hours of service per month. And what are hours? The act said hours worked. Well, that's really a hard thing to count, too, when you have people that take vacation, sick leave. So now it's all hours that you're paid for, including all those vacation hours, sick leave, other things else. So you've got to make sure that your record-keeping system actually has a way of keeping track of those hours paid for, not hours worked. Um, and for non-hourly employees, if you don't track it, you can use an equivalency method. You can count if someone's here or getting paid for one day. We're going to treat that as eight hours or 40 hours for each time that you work in any one week. However, you can't use these equivalencies to understate hours. For example, if you know someone's working three tens, you can't just go, oh, eight hours a day for three days. You're not entitled to health care coverage. So you have to look, think through that and think about today, how are we going to apply this in 2014? Because if I am large in 2014, it's going to depend on looking back today. So are you tracking everything today is what you need to look at. I know we're two and a half months in, one and a half months in, um, but start thinking about that now because you're going to have to document this and know based on today's numbers. So next slide. The hard part for calculating the full-time equivalents is because a lot of people think I have, you know, I don't have 50 employees who work 30 or more hours a week, but I have a lot of part-time employees. So what you have to do to count your full-time equivalents is add up all of their hours up to 120 per employee and divide by 120. Then you're going to divide, and it's first a monthly calculation, so we're going to go by January, February, March. You're going to add all those numbers together to determine if you have 50 when we add in all of our part-time, variable hours, not full-time employees. And if you have related companies that are owned by a common ownership of at least 80 percent, subsidiaries, you have parents, you have brother, sister corporations, all of you are treated as one company, and we're going to count all of your employees together. How did that question a lot? Can't we just make a bunch of subsidiaries of less than 50 each? Nope, that's not going to work either. So next slide. So annual calculation, very simple example that came from the reg regulations of how you determine this. This is, um, sorry, next slide. Here's an example for the uh, from the regulations that shows someone who probably thought they were not large. They have 20 full-time employees. They each average 35. 
They're easy. We know that they are going to be offered health care coverage. And then we have 40 employees who average 90 hours per month. So do the math with the FTEs, add them up. Turns out we have 50 employees, 20 of which will have to be offered health care coverage. So next slide. Seasonal exception. There is, we were involved with an industry group that was lobbying in Washington, D.C. very heavily to address the basic assumptions of the Affordable Care Act is that it's easy to know who your large employer, or who you're, whether you're large, and who your full-time employees are, and when they start, when they stop, that they're not intermittent. So we have a lot of companies with seasonal workforces, variable hour employees, intermittent. Some months they work for us, some months they don't. So the regulations and the stack of paper now have all these exceptions and rules that we need to work through, too. One of them is the seasonal exception. If you're only large because your workforce surges during seasonal periods, which we still don't know what a seasonal is. We assume Christmas um, for retail workers, but you have to apply a reasonable, good faith interpretation of what that means for your business. But if you surge over that for four months or 120 days, and most of the time you're under that 50, you won't be considered large. And the new guidance says it's not just, you don't have to just limit it to a 120-day consecutive period or four months. You could have, you can break those months apart. So say you're really, you surge above 50 for December and you surge above 50 for June. You can treat that as your four-month period and still not be large. So next slide. So big and small considerations for all businesses. The IRS is not going to get around to enforcing this until about 2016, 2017 when they start looking at, um, the income tax reports of both individuals and businesses. So say today you have 40 employees, 2017 you have 60, now you're complying with health care reform. The IRS comes knocking and says, hey, what happened in 2014? We have some people that were your employees that are getting subsidies and you may be subject to the penalty for not providing them health care coverage. You go, I don't know, where are my records? So I want you to start thinking about today how you're going to document for future years how you complied today or why you weren't subject to health care reform. So and you're going to have to prove we correctly classified all of our employees. We correctly calculated hours. And I know for a lot of companies that's going to take some systems and major changes that have to be implemented. And these can't be implemented overnight. So please think about it now. And again, 2014 mandate is depending on this year's numbers. <clears throat> so next slide, please. So you've determined your large. What coverage do you offer and who do you offer it to and when? And so this is finally, we have an exception to recognize that full time is not always known at the outset of employment and people come in and out of coverage or could if we apply the statute which says you got to provide health care coverage to everyone who's full time within 90 days of their employment. So you could have someone who's full time for 90 days, then they leave for a month, then they're out of coverage, they come back, do you have to offer them coverage again? So now we have an exception that's supposed to make this all easier. but as we walk through this, you'll have to ask yourself, is this really any easier? So next slide. So the easy ones, who do you provide coverage to? Any, uh, anyone who's full-time, if you know an employee is currently full-time or you hire someone expecting them to be full-time, you have to provide them with coverage within 90 days of their hire date. And you have to offer coverage for dependents. There's no penalty for um, coverage with the dependent not being affordable because it's based on an employee-owned premium. But note that dependents are now defined in the regulations as children under age 26, and it doesn't include spouses. Found that odd because health care um, policies and plans rarely cover employees but not spouses, but they said that in the regulations. So new employees, um, the new interpretation of you've got to provide coverage within 90 days is it now can be first uh, three full months after hire to coincide with when most coverage takes effect on the first day of the month. So next slide. So the not so easy employees are your variable hour employees. If you don't know when you hire someone that whether they're going to be full time all the time, it's reasonable to assume that everything comes down in the regulations to reasonableness. Um, whatever that means might be different for your business than another one. So what we can do now is we have this administrative period. So there's two, or a few key terms here that I want you to think about. There's a standard measurement period, a stability period, an administrative period, an initial measurement period. I know already that doesn't sound much easier than trying to figure out who your full-time employees are. But next slide. So they, this was the reason why, and again, the industry groups that we were involved with in lobbying in Washington, D.C., 
was talking about, you know, how do we determine full-time status for these employees? So this is a quote from the regulations that says, okay, this is going to be really undesirable if someone's full-time this month, not full-time next month, and they're going in and out of coverage on your employer, your plan as an employer, as well as this in and out of the state exchanges. That wouldn't be good for the state either. So next slide. So ongoing employees for 2014, what you can do is look back to 2013 because these employees, some, week, some weeks they work 30, some they don't. So you can have a standard measurement period of 3 to 12 months. And so if the employee averaged 30 hours during that standard measurement period, then the employee must be treated as full time for the following stability period. So we take a period, we look back, and then we if they met the definition of full-time by averaging it out during that time period, then we treat them as full-time for the next stability period. Clear as mud, right? And so um, the stability period must fall right after the measurement period with a gap in between for an administrative period to determine the results of your standard measurement period, but you still have to provide coverage during that, and I'll show some examples of that. The stability period has to be at least six months and can't be shorter than the standard measurement period. So if you have a standard measurement period of 12 months, you have to have a stability period of 12 months. And in that stability period, we're giving them coverage. We're not going to worry for that coverage year whether or not they are actually full time. Next slide. So here's an example. The company has a typical calendar year health plan with open enrollment in the fall. So they amend their plan. And I'll just say plan documents are really important right now. The Department of Labor just served several of my clients with a four-page inquiry asking for four pages worth of documents that they have, and a lot of companies don't have those. It's going to be even more important with health care reform to document your rules and document them in paper well, both so you don't get sued by employees and just so that you don't get sued by the Department of Labor or subject to a penalty with the IRS. So anyways, Company A amends their official plan documents to adopt a standard measurement period of October 15th through October 14th. So that will be prior year. And then they adopt an administrative period for the fall so they can shake out who, who actually worked full time in that look back period. And then we'll have open enrollment and everyone who averaged the hours in the prior standard measurement period will get coverage and be able to enroll. So next slide. So the effect on the employee, if we look at how all of this works, is that employee B Average 32 hours uh, per week in the following measurement periods. You can see the 14 to 215 th is going to be for the coverage year of 2016. Same with um, the next year for 2017. So B, who averaged 32 hours per week in the standard measurement periods, is going to be offered coverage in those following stability periods of 2016 and 2017, regardless of whether or not employee B is actually a full-time employee while receiving coverage. So next slide. Different effect on employee C. Employee C averaged 32 hours in the measurement period for 2014 to 2015 for the 2016 coverage year. C must be offered coverage for all months in 2016, including that short gap of the administrative period. But he can be denied coverage for 2017 regardless of hours because he didn't meet the hour requirement in that standard measurement period. But then if he again actually was full time while not receiving coverage, he would be required to be coverage for the next year. So very clear, right? Next slide. So the new variable hour, that was dealing with all of our regular ongoing employees. So for new variable hours and seasonal employees, kind of the same concept. We're going to have a period where we're delaying your coverage. We don't have to provide you coverage within the first 90 days, but instead we're going to adopt now our initial measurement period of 3 to 12 months. And so we can do that starting on any date between the employee's start date and the first day of the month. And so then it, it's sort of the same thing. You just look at the stability period. And then there's going to be an overlapping because you have your initial measurement period. And then if they don't make that full-time status in that time, they're also going to have, you probably would have a standard measurement period that's going to overlap and you test them again. So very complicated. If anyone's familiar with retirement plans, it's a similar concept for retirement plans for a year of service. But it's, again, it, a little bit different and people are going to have to have systems in place if you want to be able to use this to delay coverage or have some time to take a breath and figure out, okay, who really are my full-time employees? Otherwise, you can go with the original of the act and look month by month and change coverage, but I don't know anyone who wants to have that nightmare on their hands either. So next slide. Here's a transition example. I'll just run through that quickly. Um, 
you can just see it on there as to how someone is tested in the um, initial measurement period and then the standard measurement period overlapping. Next slide. So again, same message here. Do you have the ability to track? If you're going to use some of these look back periods, stability periods, you want to be able to prove all your assumptions in the future and move on. So next slide. I'll go through these really quickly. Other key provisions. Next slide. Um, the Small Business Health Options Program is the small employer exchange that is created. Washington is really far along in establishing ours. We have some other people that are going to address that. But some of the things, the interesting statistics, Washington's initially going to cover employers with less than 50 employees, and then it will increase to 100. Without shop, as I'm sure many of you know, small employers pay a lot more on the current market for health insurance coverage, if you can get it all. I have some clients who, because of experience ratings, have not been able to get coverage on the small market. So the idea of these exchanges is that you'll have more purchasing power to purchase coverage. So next slide. There's also the small business tax credit that's out there. If you have less than 25 employees, the annual wages are less than 50,000, um, and the employer is contributing at least half. And then that's increased um, to 50% uh, tax credit in 2014 if you're participating in the small employer exchange. Next slide. Additional Medicare tax withholdings. This affects everybody. I, I point out that the tax on net investment income can be um, can it affect small business employers if you, if you have an investment income, including rents and that sort of thing. So um, think about that as you're looking at your payroll systems and whether you're doing that right. So next slide. And then here's our laundry list of other employer requirements. If you have, whether you're big or small, you're going to have to provide an exchange notice, let your employees know that there's coverage available on exchanges. They're, for some plans, we'll have to pay comparative effectiveness fees and another reinsurance fee that's uh, funding research and the whole health care reform bill. And then, of course, for your coverage that you're providing, there's uh, limits on uh, pre-existing conditions, lifetime limits, those sort of things. Automatic enrollment also goes into effect. We're still waiting for guidance on automatic enrollment because we're not sure what that's going to look like, especially if we have this um, intermittent problem or we're using stability and measurement periods. But the act does say, beginning in 2014, that we have to automatically enroll anyone who is eligible for full-time coverage. Um, we have new wellness guidance out there. Um, there's more ability to create your plan to incentivize employees to be healthy, get, your, get the healthy population up. There's a whole host of laws that you have to comply with with those. We don't have time to go over today, but I also want to mention the, um, not, there's another penalty that's lesser known than the penalty tax for not offering coverage, and that's if you're discriminating in favor of your highly compensated employees. So something we see a lot, an employment agreement, CEO gets 100% paid health care coverage, we pay everyone else's 80%. Think about that carefully because there's a $100 per day penalty times the number of employees who didn't get the sweet deal that you may be subject to. So very common practice, but that penalty, if you do the math, can be very, very expensive and a lot more than the actual penalty for the employer mandate. So look, at, we're still waiting for guidance on what actually discrimination means. There was guidance a long time ago that said paying that different contribution rate could be discrimination. Some people dispute that, but for now I would say make sure that you're doing everything for all employees the same because that is a very, very stiff penalty. So next slide, that's it. Exchange status, we're going to talk, uh, someone else is going to talk about that, but Washington has created the public-private partnership and it's going to be ready to enroll in October. Idaho, the last time I checked was Monday, still some debate about that and what's going on with the current legislative session. And then the last slide is just some resources if you want to read more and learn more. The, um, the three federal agencies have great resources on their website, the U.S. Department of Labor, healthcare.gov is H HHS, and then IRS.gov, of course, is the IRS. And then we have two, uh, the two state websites up there as well. That, I'll turn it over to Mark. I'm going to do this because I'm more comfortable. I want to thank you. Four of my clients heard the IRS won't start till 2016, and they went to their smartphone. Um, GU, I'm disappointed. Next time you get uh, a chance to stand, I expect you all to jump up and down in unison doing the ah, ah, ah song, uh, kennel version. Uh, slide person. I'm a control freak, apparently, because my uh, presentation is all about timing. So we'll give it a shot here. Um, happy Valentine's Day if you brought your spouse. Congratulations, you're officially the most unromantic person in America. 
I'm going to talk about the evolution of Health Care Affordable Care Act. Let's go to the next slide. And my alternative title is really uh, Don't Be a Homer. Uh, the reason for that is when you start looking at evolution in general, especially when it comes to healthcare, you can create a problem uh, because as you evolve and you think you're evolving, you could actually end up with something you didn't want. So this is what I think is uh, the Homerism of evolution. Go ahead. Go ahead. You could become a Homer sapien. Now there are two types of Homers when it comes to evolution. The first one that we're all familiar with, the classic Odyssey by Homer who obviously thought evolution wouldn't work because he called uh, nothing weaker on this earth than man. There's also the Homer that I'm more familiar with, Homer Simpson. All right, brain, you don't like me, I don't like you, let's just do this and get it over with so I can get back to killing you with beer. Don't be a Homer. So what we're gonna do today is hopefully give you some evolutionary tips about uh, Affordable Care Act to avoid the problem of becoming a Homer Simpson when it comes to your employee benefit plan. So let me start with Go ahead and go to the next slide. We'll start with the beginning of Affordable Care Act. Why did they invent this crazy law of 2,000 some pages and what were their goals? And the goals I think you all know were universal health care coverage. So what we thought we'd do, and Heidi did a great job of overviewing at the minutia level. I'm not that smart. I'm gonna stay at about 10,000 feet as we move through this, but <clears throat> we thought we could have all Americans be covered. Well, kinda, sorta. And I say that because we decided to create a penalty that was less expensive than buying insurance by a whole bunch and then thought by penalizing people, they'll go out and buy insurance. I'm an American, you give me a penalty that's much cheaper, I'm probably not gonna do that. Employers will provide or they're gonna pay a penalty, well, kinda, sorta, you're gonna pay a penalty when your employees leave to go to the exchange and get a subsidy. If they don't go to the exchange or they don't get a subsidy, you don't pay a penalty, so that may or may not work. My favorite is individuals will buy their health care the way they buy an airplane ticket. Um, that's a great political line. For me to get on an airplane, I need to know three things. Where am I, where do I want to go, and what time do I want to leave? Done. When I buy health care, there might be more complication to that, like which doctor did my wife tell me she wanted, and if I sign up to the wrong plan, I'm a dead man. Uh, how much deductible can I afford, et cetera. And then we thought, well, we'll make these coverage rules, no pre-existing conditions, we'll extend dependence, uh, no lifetime limits, and then we'll cover preventive care. And that also sounded like a great idea until people thought preventive care covered things that would naturally fit into preventive care, and the government said, no, those don't count. But other things that don't really fit into preventive care, we'll go ahead and cover in full, so more confusion. That was the goal, that created the application. How are we gonna make all this happen? How are we gonna implement healthcare reform? And the government thought, we'll do it through the employers for the most part, so here's what we'll do. And Heidi did a great job of confusing you exactly the way I was going to, which was, as long as you have over 50 employees, you have to provide health care or pay a penalty. And as Heidi pointed out, it's just not that simple. What I thought was a 40-employee group becomes a 100-employee group when I start adding up part-timers and vice versa and all these other problems. So that was done better than I can do. I'll move on. The minimum benefits, I have to have 60% or better. I'm sure you're familiar with the medals. The Affordable Care Act created a fourth medal compared to the Olympics, but then again, we also like wrestling in Affordable Care Act, so we'll see. There was the platinum, the gold, the silver, and the bronze. You have to supply at least a 60% actuarial value of your benefit. We're still waiting on the final final on exactly what that means, but we're getting zeroed in on what you're gonna have to do. I don't think that's gonna be problematic for most employers. And then the maximum cost rules of 9.5% of the household income the safe harbor today, single employee W-2 income from the employer. We'll see exactly how that all pencils out as well. Again, people are really scared of this part of the law. I don't think you need to be. Most employers in our area are gonna pass that with flying colors. So that was the application, but the application created a number of questions, and here's what those questions looked like. And this is pretty much where most of America is today. Um, we call it the checklist and timeline syndrome. If you're still stuck there, you need to move forward. Uh, we just got a, a summary of health care reform in my office yesterday, beautifully done, very short, very brief, right to the point, 16 pages. So if you're in the, here's your timeline of everything you need to do, here's your checklist of everything you need to do, we're going to move past that today, I hope. But here's the questions that we were dealing with. Uh, will employers pay or play? Uh, and my opinion is they will. I forgot to start my watch, so I guess I have 15 minutes starting right now. Uh, they will, just kidding, they'll, they'll pay, play for a while um, because we think the penalties to the employers are too small 
And if you take a look at uh, the cost of keeping a benefit plan in place, uh, it really will pencil out for most employers, so I'm not too worried about that. A lot of employers are asking the question, do I need to build my own exchange? Well, that's a simple question. Are you an insurance company? If not, probably not. We've got an open market for you in a variety of ways. Uh, will CDHP, Consumer Directed Healthcare, take over my world? Um, yeah, probably over time. I mean, this is where the industry is clearly evolving. A lot of you in the room are looking at it. What we're talking about there is health savings accounts, healthcare reimbursement arrangements. There are rules you need to be aware of, not the least of which is if I'm putting money into a health savings account or a healthcare reimbursement account, all the dollars I'm putting in on behalf of my employees factor into the cost of insurance for both myself as the employer, so I might be at a bronze level with benefits and jump to a silver or a gold level when I add in the HRA contribution. It also will impact the excise tax rules for uh, the value of the benefit plan come 2018. Uh, and then finally, how will Medicaid impact me as an employer? Uh, that really depends on where your employees are located. Uh, State of Washington has made it clear we're gonna expand Medicaid. That's gonna add more people to the Medicaid roles. Some of those might be your employees or their dependents. State of Idaho, pretty much digging in saying we're not gonna expand, so probably wouldn't have the same impact. So that puts us to where we are today, which is, okay, we've got through some questions. What do I do with all this? What's my strategy moving forward? What have I learned? So I wanna kinda take some of the education pieces I just gave you and apply them. Let's go to the next slide and let's not forget my topic, which was don't be a Homer. Uh, when we talk about education, here's what Homer Simpson thinks about that. How is education supposed to make me any smarter? Every time I learn something, it pushes the old stuff out of my brain. So let me take some of the stuff out of your brain and put some new thoughts in there that might help you actually apply uh, Affordable Care Act to what you're doing. We had three very clear, clear uh, clarifications. We've got one to go. So the three clarifications uh, that just were recent were uh, the subsidy eligibility, who qualifies for a subsidy and who doesn't, which is gonna be important to an employer. So that will kind of tell you how your employees are gonna migrate. The 30-hour rule, which Heidi did a better job than I could of explaining, so I'll talk very briefly on who's part-time and who's full-time when it comes to Affordable Care Act. Uh, the alphabet alphabetizing of your health care system, the Consumer Directed Health Plan and the HRA HSA was, was clarified, and we'll talk about that. And I think I got one more. Uh, the carrot, the stick, or quit. Uh, what am I gonna do with this wellness program concept? Everybody wants one. How do I build one? How do we make that happen? So let's take these one at a time. Uh, the subsidy eligibility, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, when you read the regs, it almost makes you feel like there's a way to sort of weasel your way in or weasel your way out of subsidy. And I love using that term because as Homer says, that separates us from the animals, except of course, the weasel. <laughs> so let's talk about subsidy eligibility. I think there's a misnomer. If I am offering my employee a qualified plan or any dependent of my employee a qualified plan, they cannot get a subsidy in the exchange. Why that's important is we're gonna have employers flip the equation upside down, I think, which used to look like a negative is going to become a positive. In other words, I may say it's time to no longer offer spousal coverage at the employer. And that sounds negative, but if the majority of my employees are such that their spouses could go to the exchange and get a subsidized health care option compared to having to pay the rate I charge my employees if I don't contribute toward dependents, I'm actually hurting a number of my employees by offering spouse coverage that's not being purchased. And my employee might say, I would have put my spouse on the, on the uh, uh, exchange with a subsidy, but she or he no longer qualifies if they qualified, it would actually be a better deal for me. Again, it's gonna turn the world upside down to a certain degree to have an employer say, it might be a better thing for me to not offer spousal coverage. Is it an either or? Is it they sign up for my employer plan or they immediately go to the exchange? No, we're gonna have private exchanges that you don't pay a penalty on if your employees go to. We're gonna have the individual market that the employer will not pay a penalty if their employees go to. You're only gonna pay a penalty if your employee leaves you, goes to the subsidy, or excuse me, goes to the exchange, qualifies for subsidy, and the reason they left you was you had an unqualified medical plan, either through premium or benefit. And then the employer penalty for exchange pur purchases, well, I pretty much just covered that, so we'll 
move on. Uh, clarifying who is working, uh, again, I'm gonna defer to Heidi. She had a lot more detail than I had about the 30 hour a week employee, but what the heck, it's a, it's a Valentine's Day, why not another Homer Simpson? Son, if you really wanna work at something in life, you have to work. Now quiet, they're about to announce the lottery numbers. We can all affordable, uh, afford Affordable Care Act as long as we all hit the lottery. Uh, 30 hours a week, as I talked, to, as Heidi already talked about, the 30 hours is scheduled or non-scheduled. So I, I, we were just talking over breakfast and said probably the biggest problem employers face in all of this with affordable care is the me measurement period, the standardization period, the administrative period. And I just want to make this clear because I think Heidi did a good job, but you will be in a world where you have somebody working 15 hours a week on your medical plan while someone else is working 40 hours a week and not yet qualified for your medical plan. Because the person working 15 during the period that you measured them were working more than 30 and now are stable in your medical plan even though they shouldn't qualify, but they qualified back here so I stabilize them here while someone else is working enough to qualify here but I haven't measured them long enough to get them on the plan. Good luck with that. But Heidi's right, the whole point is plan now for the future impact. And then we have the failed HRA strategy. I can't tell you how many seminars I've been to as an insurance broker where people will stand up and say, I have the future and the future is with my company. We administer healthcare reimbursements, reimbursement arrangements, get your employers out of the healthcare business, just have them throw a bunch of money in a pot, let their employees go out and buy individual plans, it's gonna be great. I call it the failed HRA strategy. And as Homer likes to say, you tried your best, you failed miserably, the lesson is never try. <laughs> Why is that a failed strategy? The IRS has made it pretty clear that under Affordable Care Act, remember at the very beginning the goal was no limits in a medical plan. IRS has said the HRA standalone is a medical plan and by definition it has a limit. Employer says I'm giving you $3,000 a year, $4,000 a year, it is a limit. The idea was, yeah, but if you use these $3,000 to go buy an unlimited individual benefit, there's no longer a limit. That was the idea. The IRS said, you failed miserably, don't try. Uh, can't do that. We can have HRAs in place, but the HRAs must attach to a group medical plan. What am I talking about? A number of you in the room have them already, but it would be something like I'm buying a deductible at X dollars from Group Health or my insurer, and I am funding the backside of that deductible underneath that with my own cash through an HRA. That you can do because although the HRA by definition has limit, it's tied to an unlimited group medical plan. It's not the holy grail, uh, but it's a workable solution and the idea that you can dump the group plan in favor of individual plans in a group environment is not gonna happen. So that leads us to wellness, and the wellness questions still remain. Remember I said we had three clarifications and one to go, and the one to go to me is really very intriguing. Um, if at first you don't succeed, give up. Just kidding. Uh, by the way, you can't read the bottom there. It says face palm when don't just isn't enough, which I kind of, Really enjoyed. All right, what am I talking about with wellness? Well, I consider the wellness regulations the North-South Freeway. We all want it, where is it? <laughs> Can wellness be my cost bridge? We think so. But the challenge is, and the clarification that we're waiting on is really in the application. Uh, you've probably read that with a Affordable Care Act, uh, they have said that I can apply up to a 20% premium penalty for participants versus non-participants, or as Heidi likes to call them, incentives for the participant and no incentive for the non-participant. And I know that's politically correct, so I'll go with that. Uh, my clients, penalty. Um, just kidding. Am I up? Perfect, this is my last point. Uh, can you back that up for just a second? Right there. Uh, what I want to make clear is those penalties go up to 30% in 2014. The clarification we're waiting on is if my employee premium is below the 9.5%, so I'm in the safe harbor, 
but somebody does not take advantage of my wellness program and their premium goes up and puts them over the 9.5% safe harbor, am I as the employer in trouble or not? Um, I'm not sure the IRS is gonna rule on that to be perfectly candid with you. Our suggestion is you're pretty safe moving forward. You wanna get some legal guidance on that. Uh, we can talk to you about that. Will it work? Yes, I think wellness will work long term. I've got one more slide. Work the numbers. The bottom line is if you're gonna evolve your company to match the evolution of Affordable Care Act, you've gotta understand the numbers for you individually because I think every employer in here is gonna deal with a different dynamic. Part-time to full-time, wellness, no wellness. Uh, what I'm trying to do, you know, number of dependents for key employees versus non-key employees. A significant issue. So I'll finish with a lighthearted comment. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Uh, remember, marriage is like a coffin and each kid is another nail. Thank all of you for coming today and taking your time uh, to support GSI and to, to come <laughs> listen to us. Um, next slide and one after that. Um, we got a great intro here today, and, and we were characterized as being experts. Um, and I think you've just heard from two experts. Uh, I'm going to talk about exchanges today, and I, I guess my thought is, uh, is an expert somebody who knows some things or somebody who actually knows some answers? Because if you're looking for somebody who knows some things, I know some things about the exchanges, um, but if right now you're looking for definitive answers on the exchanges nobody has definitive answers and certainly not me so i'm going to share with you really pretty high level stuff uh, and at the end you're going to see the call to action is that uh, each of you spend time learning and spend time talking to heidi and mark who are the ones who really know what they're talking about today so let's go to the next slide um, when i think about health care reform uh, as sort of the strategy guy for Washington Dental Service, the hardest thing in the world is to keep line of sight about what health care reform is really about. And so this is a picture that I've been looking at, and if you see the numbers, you can see I've been looking at it since 2010. I should probably update it, but the story is the same. This is what health care reform is about. It's about what's happening uh, to medical inflation in, in our country. Um, medical costs have more than doubled since the beginning of, of the, uh, the decade. Um, and um, it's only going up from there. And if you look at not only the, the budgets of your companies, but also our state and federal government as well, um, medical costs are the main thing that are driving the economic, long-term economic problems in the United States. So I'm here to say as much as this recession and the stimulus and all that stuff, that is not what's driving the financial problem in the United States. It's health care and entitlement costs. And the, the federal health care reform act is the attempt to answer that. And if you go to the next slide, the reason you have to keep lying of sight on what this is about is this is what it feels like every day. Um, and I, I, I'm not going through this. So you can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, th that slide really is what's being put into practice. And I think that what Heidi and, and Mark talk about give you um, really just a slice of how complex it is. And I know all of you and your companies have been starting to grasp with well, what are the pieces of this complexity I need to know about um, and how do I make strategic decisions. Well, here's how we think about it, what it really boils down to. Healthcare reform is about providing money to people to buy health insurance. Uh, it's about requiring that people buy health insurance. And it's about introducing some new markets for selling health insurance. And the exchanges, really, the way you have to look at them is their markets, their channels. Just as today you may buy your health insurance through a broker, or if you're an individual consumer, you may buy it from a website someplace. This is the government and on um, some private solutions I'm going to talk about for briefly uh, to try to get a, at all of that. The intent is to provide access to consumers. Uh, the intent is to provide choice for consumers. Um, and of course to control costs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's go to the next slide. So as we look at exchanges, um, you know, a whole lot of people are really scrambling to get ready for all of this stuff. Uh, the government 
uh, down at Olympia is working very hard. There's a, an organization they've set up called the Health Benefits Exchange, which is working very hard to define the public exchanges. The insurance commissioner is working hard, very hard to figure out what are the products that they can sell. Um, believe me, the complexity that Heidi shared that every employer faces, um, multiply that for what these folks down in the government are trying to figure out as they put together their exchange. And what it means is the answers are slow in coming and um, the, the, the biggest challenge in putting together these exchanges is finding answers that you can actually stick. Um, and, and they've actually sort of moved. And the thing that's made it a little harder, I think, for some of the folks in Olympia is because of the election cycle last year and because of the Supreme Court challenge, the federal government has been very, very late in providing guidance to, to how these exchanges need to work and, frankly, exchanges for uh, answers for the remainder of these, these health care reform detailed implementation questions. One of the things that really struck me when I first got involved in this health care reform stuff in 2009 this is a 2,000 page law that when you actually read it, and, and I have, I don't really want to admit it, it's vague. It's 2,000 pages of vagueness. And like Heidi said, now we've got like this stack of paper of regulations, and it's still a little bit vague. So, you know, it's, if you're feeling like, gosh, what are the answers? Um, you don't necessarily need to feel like there's some secret that you don't know about. In a lot of cases, there's no secret, and there's, the answers are still being figured out. But let's go to the next slide, and let's talk about the exchanges and, and, and what they're going to be. There's three types of exchanges. Two of them will be run by the government. And um, the other, as you see on the right-hand side of the slide, I've labeled non-HCR, and that's important. So first of all, let's start with the government ones. The individual exchange is being stood up to support uninsured people. That is the purpose of that exchange. Uh, there's not... It's not designed to force companies to drop coverage and send people there, and nor is there, as, as the thinking evolves, a particularly high expectation that the individual exchange is going to be the way the majority of Americans buy their health insurance in the future. It, it's really there to focus on the uninsured. And the, and the key thing to realize when you think about this is um, there are premium subsidies for folks up to 400 percent of federal poverty level, which for family of four is about $80,000 a year. So the premium subsidies for families aren't all that bad. Um, those premium subsidies for the individual can only be accessed on the individual exchange. While, so while there still will be an individual market for health insurance and dental insurance outside the exchange, it will be unsubsidized. Uh, the shop exchange, as Heidi mentioned, the value proposition is lower price. Um, and there will be some subsidies to some small groups. Um, I have to tell you, as these two things are evolving, the number one focus in the policy circles in Olympia and in Washington, D.C., has been to stand up the individual exchange. Um, the shop has not been the number one focus uh, because their number one public policy challenge is the uninsured. Um, they know that there is already a market that's pretty robust. Uh, there is definitely some cost inequality for smaller groups that do pay higher prices than, higher, than larger groups. Um, but there's a market. And so I guess as I look at what's happening down in Olympia and elsewhere, and, and incidentally, this is how the Massachusetts exchange rolled out in 2006. Uh, the individual exchange policy building and also the functionality of the exchange software and the buying experience is going to be, is going to be significantly more sophisticated um, than the shop exchange. Uh, the, additionally, the value proposition of lower price um, I don't want to editorialize overly much, but I would say it's a good aspiration. You all will have to work with your brokers and look at the prices and make up your own mind whether it's actually, be, actually going to be lower priced. The reality is the way things work at the insurance commissioner is all of us carriers file community rated products already to sell to the small market in which all the experience from all the small groups is already pooled. And the insurance commissioner reviews what we're providing and decides whether they think we have priced it appropriately or, or where our calculations are wrong, or we built in too much profit or whatever. The products that are going to go on the shop exchange in 2014 are going to be constructed in exactly the same way. They're going to be out of one big community pool. The same insurance commissioner, the same person is going to review these product designs and either approve them or not based on the same criteria. So over time, will there be a value proposition in the shop exchange that will really lead to lower prices? Um, 
I think it is a very good idea to keep your eye on it. I don't know that it's going to be the savior of health insurance costs for small employers. Now, on the other hand, the private exchanges, the reason I've called those non-healthcare reform is the private exchanges have nothing to do with the ACA. Now, that's a little bit of a strong statement, but I'll say it again. It has nothing to do with ACA. What it has to do with is that cost curve I showed at the beginning. The private exchanges are being set up by large brokerage houses, regional brokerage houses, health plans. Um, the models are all over the place. There's no standards there. And, and so, um, again, as an employer, these are something you should be uh, learning about as they evolve to see if they offer something for you. I can give you a couple models from the first few they are going to roll out. They both come from national brokerage houses. One of them uh, actually launched their private exchange last year, and um, their uh, model looks very much like a, big, a shop exchange for large employers. So they have predefined products, they have metal levels, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. It's all uh, risk business. Um, you, put your, you, you give your employees a, pr a fixed premium subsidy and they go into the market and they pick their plan and they buy it. Um, another one that's getting ready from another very large national one to launch this year isn't the same. It's also aimed at large employers. Um, but it's not all underwritten. They, they allow ASO accounts. They allow each employer to custom design what plan designs they want to offer and, and which carriers they want to offer on the private exchange. So the, the key thing is here, there is a real attempt to, to create some standards in these government exchanges, but you're not going to see um, the same attempt to create standards in private exchanges. In fact, you're going to see them trying to differentiate and create diff models that will be different from what the government's offering and, and from what each other's offering. If they had covered dental care for those adults, sorry, sorry about that. Um, if they had covered dental care, it would have cost 14 million. Additionally, um, if they covered dental care, the, the study shows that they would have saved 24 million dollars in the cost of diabetes. So, um, 48 million dollars um, that they spent, whereas they might have spent 14 million dollars. This is the reality of the, the growing understanding of, of dental disease from the standpoint of how important it is to health um, and also that there is a very substantial savings multiplier. Uh, we feel that while dental is one of the most valued benefits out there and people have known that forever and you've known that your employees um, value that, um, in, this, in this environment of all this uncertainty around health care reform, we think it's important that dental not be overlooked. Please go to the next slide. Um, here's where it gets very confusing in health care reform, and I, I apologize, I'm going over just a minute, but I really need to explain this. Um, health care reform mandates coverage of dental care for children, and actually how old a child is is evolving. In fact, since I made this slide a couple of weeks ago, it's now 0 through 19. So when you offer, a, uh, if you're a small group, um, next year, if you're going to have a qualified health plan to offer to your employees, it will have to include uh, dental care for children under 19 years old, and it'll have to be within the plan. Uh, when people go to the exchange, the individual exchange, they will be required to buy a dental plan for children 19 years old and under. Uh, now, the top part there, for adults and dependents between age 20 and 26, it's not covered in health care reform means there's no subsidies, it's not available in the government exchanges, and if uh, to the extent that you want to continue to provide it to your employees, you'll have to purchase it um, in the open market, hopefully from us. Um, the, obviously, this creates some real concerns I think we all should have, is how do you not stop, fall, how do you not fall through the cracks? Um, there will be people who buy that child coverage who are assuming that their college kids through age 26 are covered because, right, that's how old dependents are covered. They're not. They're only covered until they turn 20. Um, there will be people who will buy that child coverage and not read the fine print and think that it's a dental plan for the whole family and find out that they themselves are not covered. So I think it will be very important to, to look at your options and make sure to educate your employees. And if you come to the last slide, um, what should I do? So. Here's the thing about those uh, exchanges, and I'm going to repeat it again. Um, if expert means knowing what the answers will be, there's no experts on the exchanges right now. So the main uh, 
thing I would recommend that we all take away from here today is, is get advice. Talk to your broker, uh, talk to Heidi or your, your tax lawyer or your accountant. Um, find out how this affects your thing and then keep an eye on things. Here's the, the WashingtonHealthBenefitExchange.org website. Um, the, another uh, website that I have found if you're doing your own research on healthcare reform is extraordinarily helpful is Kaiser Family Foundation. They're tracking what's happening at the federal level and they're also doing a pretty good job at the state level. So if you Google Kaiser Family Foundation um, for your own reading up, um, that's useful as well. And then finally, remember oral health is a key component of overall health. Thank you. Thank you. And in Spokane, many, many of our members have a group health primary care provider, but receive specialty acute care and inpatient care through the contracted network. So we're actually a little bit of everything. If you go to the next slide, um, group health in Spokane in particular, we have our own uh, owned and operated medical centers, and we actually two years ago acquired Columbia Medical Associates, so the, those CMA uh, physicians are actually group health physicians today. That me means we have over 120 physicians and providers, um, and we're the largest primary care group in Spokane. We have a partnership for Providence, which I'll speak to a moment later, um, and a myriad of other contracted providers, and are really trying to build um, a system of care through key relationships throughout the area. So if you go to the next slide, part of this talk was about all the mergers and acquisitions and partnerships um, happening in the community and how the healthcare law and other factors are driving us toward those um, market changes. Around the country, there have been significant plan mergers and acquisitions. As everyone looks to what will help them be stronger in the future, plays in Medicare and Medicaid, changes in the exchange market, changes in employer-based insurance. In our state, the theme around health plans has actually less been about um, acquisitions and mergers and more actually about new entrants into the market. In Medicaid, starting um, last year, this year, and going into next year, we have a lot of new uh, national carriers and new plans operating in our Medicare pro Medicaid program. Um, and it has yet to be seen, but we'll be watching closely to see what the exchange market looks like going into next year and into the years ahead. Um, to the next slide, uh, actually there has been much more movement on the provider side. Uh, the first wave of mergers and acquisitions in Washington, and we'll see, yet to see whether there's gonna be a second wave, but really has been among provider affiliations. And these have been driven, they're of all manner of different affiliations um, as evidenced by this, uh, this slide. And um, I'll tell you this slide, an earlier version actually had little hearts around some of the um, the logo pairs, um, we decided to take that out, but I thought it was actually kind of a, a fun Valentine's Day note. Um, but these actually, these mergers and acquisitions have been driven by, in some cases, declining reimbursement from Medicaid and from uh, payers. A move slowly, but a move away from fee for, traditional fee-for-service reimbursement as new methods emerge. Medicare is driving that train, and I'll speak to that in a minute, um, but private sector payers as well as well as changes in the market driven by healthcare reform on the coverage side, as employers are really looking for, given all of the dynamics um, that were outlined, particularly by Heidi and Mark earlier, as employers are looking for new solutions that will help them keep, keep their costs down and make care more of a system and a sensible coordinated system for their employers, uh, for their employees as they navigate all of these dynamics going forward. So to the next slide. Since payment is such a key driver of this, I just thought I'd spend a moment talking about um, payment for healthcare. And starting with how group health um, pays, it's actually kind of an interesting uh, model showing some of the different types of payment in the system. Group health physicians, our own doctors, are actually paid by salary. Um, we've resisted historically the more you do, the more you make incentives, which are generally prevalent in the community giving physicians um, the ability to spend more time with patients and creating aligned incentives for them to provide high value services that have been known to make the most <clears throat> material difference in healthcare. In the contracted network, on the other hand, we pay our physicians largely according to a negotiated fee-for-service fee schedule, much the way traditional Medicare does. We've begun exporting our internal model into the contracted network by aligning payment incentives for hospital and specialty care with value-based incentives within the group practice, but there's still a ways to go. To the next slide. Um, in order to really actually make a difference, we and the rest of the healthcare system need to take this to the next level to fundamentally change healthcare and ensure that, for example, those mergers and affiliations that we talked about 
drive toward, regardless of what they're driven by, drive toward true integration of care, true lower cost and higher value in healthcare, and toward aligned incentives between the purchaser, the employer, the patient, um, and the government as well. And not just toward leverage or increasing price. To the next slide, a little bit about how we might get there. So group health has taken one approach, um, which is to start with a patient-centered medical home as the core of the healthcare system, and to pay in the patient-centered medical home on that more salaried, coordinated model, so that the incentive for the physician and the care team is to really give the patient the right care at the right time. Um, this practice model compensates physicians for uh, taking care of the whole patient, for example, including virtual care and things that are not generally reimbursed individually in the fee-for-service market, which can be a challenge for those physicians who want to email with their, with their um, patients or who want to um, offer phone service with their patients but are not actually reimbursed for that and in many cases do it out of the goodness of their heart and because that's kind of why they came to medicine. Um, this also encourages patients to adopt healthy behaviors because they're really part of the care team themselves. And we've expanded this model, the primary care model, to all of our medical centers and are working to do so outside of our system and into the community. But the next step is to align those incentives beyond the primary care medical home and across the entire spectrum of healthcare. And this is something that healthcare um, organizations across the spectrum are looking at and part of why you're starting to see those mergers and affiliations across the system. New sophisticated tools will help us take a data-driven approach to this, paying providers, but accounting for things like initial patient health status so that p providers are not disadvantaged if they end up with a sicker patient population. So to the next slide, a little bit more about how that might work. So on the left side of the slide, you see the total premium cost, which is the expected, looking a year ahead, the expected total cost of care and the administrative costs of providing those benefits. The way that we're looking at paying providers is to benchmark against the expected total cost of care and then ask providers to do what they need to do to keep their patients healthy, put incentives in place for quality and value, and then at the end of the year measure the actual cost of care against that expected total cost. And if there's a difference and the providers still meet their quality targets for patient satisfaction and for clinical quality, those shared savings are then divvied up between the purchaser, the employer, um, group health or the, the care system, and the provider itself. We're starting to pilot this model with Providence here in Spokane, with the Everett Clinic out in Everett, and these projects are still prototypes, as many of the projects similarly around the state um, going on today are. But we hope to be able to report on their quality and cost uh, outcomes in the future and build upon these models as we go forward. Just to the next slide. Um, the next generation of payment reform will require uh, purchasers to be really engaged, and um, because I know we're short on time, I'll focus here and then just kind of um, slip to the end. We uh, need to focus on three things, and one of them is payment reform. We've spoken about that today. And pay purchasers can actually really look for that from their healthcare providers as they're evaluating their healthcare choices going into next year, looking for pans, plans that actually are pushing the envelope of payment reform. The next thing is to ask for um, and look for plans that are building high-performing networks. So where there are incentives for employees to choose higher value, higher quality providers. And third, looking for an arrangement with um, a carrier that will uh, start to develop a value-based benefit design. So Group Health has actually done this, this with our own employers because in addition to being a healthcare organization, we also are a major employer and have to worry about our own employees' healthcare costs. We've developed a system so that, for example, group health employees with chronic conditions can pay lower costs for drugs and services affiliated with a chronic condition that are known to improve their outcomes, where they might pay a higher cost for uh, elective surgeries or for high-end imaging not recommended by their physician, so that they actually some, have some incentive there as well. Um, to the next slide. Uh, what I would just want to um, note, because I was asked to do this, um, and, and this is one of the things that was up front, how healthcare system is driving uh, this train, and then um, we'll end here and go to questions. So some of the provisions in the law that have actually driven this have included, as I mentioned, declining reimbursement, but also moving toward quality-based payment, incentive for electronic health records, 
creating these new accountable care organizations, demonstration programs. There's a lot of churn in the healthcare system. And a lot of these provisions in the Affordable Care Act were pilots and demonstrations and things that are not permanent. But the healthcare system is responding. And so if you just flip a couple of slides ahead um, to uh, keep going, and hopefully these slides will be available so you can um, see them in your packet later. The long term, the last slide, what we're all aiming for is to bend the healthcare cost to curve, to change the market, and to be able to grapple sustainably going into the future with these new requirements that the other panelists outlined. Or the ultimate goal being to create a better patient experience, create affordability for um, patients and employers, and a lot of that will have to do with not just grappling with the new coverage requirements, but really demanding system change. Thank you.